Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We are doing part two of growing ginger, turmeric, and galangal. Uh, we have Nick Frillman. He is grilling Ken uh, and myself about how to grow these crops. Uh, these questions are Boy, they they just keep coming. We're sweating. He's got the he's got the light on us, shining down really, really hot on us. So I uh, can't wait to dive into part two. So remember, last week we talked about what are these spices? Um, where do you source them? How, what's the pre sprouting process? Now it's time to get them in the ground, and that's where we're going to jump off from this point. But of course, I'm not doing this by myself. I am joined, as I was last week, by horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. Excited to be back at it again. Oh, I just I can't stop talking about this topic. Maybe we'll do this every week. Every week, we'll just keep talking about these spices. It's so much fun. I have so much to share. Yes. How about yourself? Yeah, I got, I got a decent amount I can share still. So. <laughs> he's got one growing season under his belt with these things. And so he's, but he's not going to stop. He's, he's addicted. He's hooked. We're going to grow all kinds next year or this year. Mm-hmm. I know, I keep thinking it's still 2022. It's not 2023, here we are. Um, and of course, we are joined by uh, local food, small farms educator, Nick Frillman in the Bloomington Normal Office. Hey, Nick. Hey, Chris and Ken. Uh, yeah, it's good to be back for uh, part two, uh, cutting my uh, interviewing teeth right here in uh, the Good Growing Podcast. So yeah, let's jump right in. Um, and just a little bit of a, a recap from last week. Um, we talked about how I was acting as a hypothetical um, high value horticultural crop grower, high tunnel grower. I know my way around a, um, a living um, growing tomatoes and cucumbers, let's say, in a high tunnel. Um, we talked about adding in the ginger, galangal, or turmeric uh, crops into my rotations, the importance of breaking up disease cycles and dollar value per square foot. And like you said, yeah, I was keeping the questions going. So we're going to do that again today and uh, start off um, painting another picture. So, um, all right, by, by the grace of the plant gods, um, I've gotten my ginger, turmeric, and galangal to germinate, all thanks to um, the uh, cutting edge knowledge of uh, Chris Enroth and, and Ken Johnson. And so uh, thanks for that um, transfer of knowledge last week. Um, now that I've gotten my sprouted tropical crops uh, and, I, and I did not forget to uh, check for their sprouts. I got my grow lights. Everything's going okay. It's time to go outside and plant. The weather's looking good. Um, so now that they're germinated, how do you plant them? How far apart do you plant them? Um, and then what's the weather got to be to plant set up in the high tunnel, low tunnel? Paint us a picture. So picture this, uh, <laughs> Nick, you are, you're in your greenhouse, your, your basement, wherever you're going to pre-sprout these. It has been weeks, if not months. And um, I want to make sure that if you are not ready to yet put these in the ground, an important step here is giving these plants a little bit of fertilizer, because if you have to wait to get them in the ground, they have just spent a long time in flats. We've been watering them, which means we've leached out all of those nutrients in that potting mix. So they need some, some fertilizer. And so you can do a slow release. You can do a quick release, whatever you want. Just give them a little bit to uh, a little bit of nutrients. Uh, to hold them until you get them into the ground. Great. So, uh, so you've mentioned I need some uh, uh, fertility uh, in inputs in my flats of uh, emerging turmeric, ginger, and galangal. So, I remember last week uh, we were talking about maybe stacking the flats that we germinate them in on top of each other. So, you know, hypothetically, could I like fertigate over the top of the first one and then it kind of you know trickles down through the flats? Or, um, yeah, what is the what does fertility input look like in the germination setting? And maybe what um, do you use as well? Yeah, so I, I'd say the the main thing that I have used in the past is going to be just a simple slow release uh, fertilizer. Um, I've used both the organic type, which is just the worm castings from my worm bin, which are right next to my germination rack. Um, I've used the synthetic slow release uh, pellets as well. Um, so I, I, I use them all. Now, I would say fertility when you're pre-sprouting and they're all stacked on top of each other, it's not going to do much for you, at mm. least that we're aware of, because those plants aren't using anything. They have not developed any roots. They have no way to necessarily absorb those nutrients. And so there's there's no reason to, when they're stacked up, mm -hmm. 
to provide any type of fertility okay. because it's it, it's just not going to be used. And and I've done that before where I've stacked everything up and I have and I've watered from the top and I've gotten uneven or inconsistent water oh. for each flat. And and so I, I would just say that when you're going in, just check, make sure that the, the flat um, has enough moisture. You don't want it to be bone dry. You don't want it to be saturated. Um, but once they've sprouted, get them a little dose of fertilizer. Um, and I've even used just a, a quick mix up of like a, a, a synthetic, like quick release fertilizer, liquid feed, um, uh, just, just to get them a little boost to hold them until we get the ground prepped, uh, if that's going to be a couple weeks. So, yeah. But in terms of ground preparation, Ken, he, he was my, uh, he was my muscle in the garden for getting that done. So, uh, Ken, I guess, uh, what, what was the process in, in preparing that bed? Um, so for, for where we were at in Jacksonville, this was a new location. So we built the, the Caterpillar tunnel last year and, and planted everything. So, you know, we went through, killed off all the turf and, um, got that ready. Uh, what we did is we <clears throat> dug a, dug a little trench, uh, with hoe and, and shovels and we'll do that three or four inches deep. Here we're taking two, three inches deep. Um, so just dug that trench. So we just did one row, a uh, 50 foot row. Uh, and then we went in and um, put in um, organic fertilizer, um, kind of supplement that that's you know, nutrition in the soil. Uh, and then went in and, and placed our seed pieces that have already germinated for the most part, with the exception of the, the turmeric. Um, and placed those in there and we would do six inch spacing. Six inch um, spacing um, seemed a little close, but it, that's the recommendation. Yeah. Yep. So it, put, it just went down the line, you know, flagged off the individual uh, types so we could keep track of what was what. Uh, and then went in, covered it up um, <clears throat> to make sure, you know, all the, the rhizomes were all covered and, and kind of that that growth coming off, you know, the first real close to that rhizome is still is kind of white and colored and made sure that was all covered up. So we just had green uh, sticking up. Uh, and then eventually we put uh, wood chips down. I think a lot of the other sites did straw mulch, but we had a, a source of free wood chips. So we we wood chipped everything uh, in there to help keep the weeds down. And, and before we got that in there, we had some, it was going out once a week pulling weeds. Uh, so when we must have got that, those wood chips down, uh, is maybe pulling up an occasional weed here and there. Yeah. I, and I think we amended that trench too with like a compost. It was like a yard waste compost, uh, commercial compost. Um, in addition to that uh, fertilizer, we did a, a slow, relight, slow release pelleted. I think it was a 14, 14, 14 um, slow release. And we just applied to that 50 foot row per the products uh, label. And that was in the trench or on top of after the fact? That was in the trench. And then, okay. yeah, we laid the sprouted pieces in and covered them up. Got it. Seems yeah. pretty straightforward. But I think everybody else put down their drip tape. And Ken oh. did not put his drip <laughs> tape down because Ken didn't have water. <laughs> so, we brought bucket, time. so we brought buckets out. I do not. It's a good, a good exercise, but I don't recommend if you're going to be doing, <laughs> doing this at a large scale. And and just a reminder to people listening, watching, Ken grew the most ginger turmeric and galangal than any other site in the state. So hmm. uh, he uh, he was really working hard. I really I owe him a lot. Um, you know, more than a steak dinner. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm still waiting for my crown. <laughs> yes, he needs. He is the. Uh, we're gonna call Jacksonville the ginger capital of Illinois right now. So okay. <laughs> We should uh, start a contest this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if, uh, I mean, surely fertility plays a very important role in developing really big rhizomes. Um, and so we'll get into that in, in one second. But I wonder, you know, um, I, I'd like to see a soil test result for the different sites that, that grow this ginger to maybe see if uh, maybe Jacksonville had a higher, you know, native fertility in the soil prior to, or maybe it is uh, that they like like more water and will absorb more nutrients with more water but um that being said there's always more to learn growing uh, new high value horticultural crops and and that's why we have conversations like these mm -hmm. so um yeah make sure and set up your irrigation when you plant folks and uh 
get some uh, water to those uh, establishing plants or, uh, you know, bring your um, really heavy water buckets over, uh, whatever, <laughs> what's your boat. And um, so getting into it, what are the fertility requirements of these um, three crops once the plants are in the high tunnel, low tunnel, wherever they're being grown, um, they're in the ground for the season. We've amended our uh, planting trench, maybe with some compost, covered that up, added some um, slow release organic or inorganic fertilizer, uh, whatever's around. Um, I've heard they're heavy feeders like cucumbers or tomatoes. So in that way they fit in, in with this crowd of high tunnel plants. But can we get into that a little bit more? Definitely. So as you mentioned, Nick, they heavy feeders like cucumber and tomato. Now, unlike cucumber and tomato, they're not putting on as much biomass as those other two crops. Now, tomatoes, they pull on a ton of growth. Cucumbers is a ton of growth. Ginger, yeah, it can be kind of dense, but it's not going to be the biomass that those other two put on. Um, but they still are, they're heavy feeders because they're lousy scavengers for nutrients. Um, so I can I throw a picture up here. Um, so this is a side-by-side -side comparison of ginger grown in the field, so in the ground, versus ginger. We've also done this hydroponically. Now, the interesting thing about ginger grown in the field uh, or, or in containers or whatnot is that they are they don't have very many roots. Um, they, they do not develop very many fine roots for scavenging nutrients. So that means that when we apply nutrients, we really need to apply them at the site at where mm. the plant is located um, versus hydroponic uh, growing. Um, you know, they developed a lot of fine root hairs and maybe that would have developed into something a little bit uh, larger of like a hand of ginger that we could have harvested. Unfortunately, we had to terminate that one because there was an herbicide study being done in that same greenhouse. And so we had to move our plants and that we just killed them, pulled them up and harvested them and took a look at them. It was pretty neat. So in the future, we're going to look at a hydroponically grown uh, ginger. And uh, so we'll update you on that next year or the year after, whenever we get it done. Um, but because they're lousy scavengers, they do work really well. So if you're a, a farmer and you're injecting fertilizer into your irrigation for your tomatoes and cucumbers, that's the same, uh, that, that routine works just, it will work just right for our ginger and our turmeric and galangal crops. Um, now, if, if you want to, if you're not injecting fertilizer, you're a backyard grower, slow releases and compost, amending that soil to be nice and rich uh, is, is going to be a, an added benefit to, to you for doing that. So once again, you're, you're providing those nutrients as the plant needs it, where it's located. It doesn't have to go look for it um, because, it, again, it doesn't have that root system that really can do that. Um, and so the other key thing, you know, I get, I, I mentioned this last week, how, when it comes to fertilizers, I thought, oh, we're going to need a lot of phosphorus for root growth. We're not growing roots. We're growing rhizomes, which is a stem, which is nitrogen. So we need to make sure that we're applying enough nitrogen so that we get uh, a good rhizome development, which is going to send us more leaf stalks. We're going to get more leaf buds off of that stem which means we're gonna get a, a better yield uh, over time. So nitrogen is a pretty critical factor here. Um, whereas with like tomatoes and cucumbers, you don't wanna overdo the nitrogen because you're gonna get beautiful plants and no fruit. Um, so just make sure that you're, you're keeping an eye and that you're not, uh, if you're selecting for a nutrient for these three crops, uh, ginger, turmeric, or galangal, uh, you're gonna to wanna to keep an eye on your nitrogen. That's a really good tip. So uh, I'm imagining, in addition to uh, planting time, when I add some slow release fertilizer, that slow release is usually, you know, wicked away or utilized um, during sporadic watering. So you know, if you're, I mean, nobody's growing these outdoors because of the, you know, um, season extension factor, right, in Illinois. But so for people growing these in other countries, um, I'm imagining that when it rains. It uses up that slow release fertilizer. That'll be the same case as if you're irrigating in a greenhouse here or a high tunnel. And so you're going to need to probably um, reapply that uh, sl slow release fertilizer at some other point during the season, maybe multiple times. So mm -hmm. is there any kind of, you know, uh, rule of thumb schedule for that? Like every two months reapply at the surface and water? So one thing with ginger 
that is different from turmeric and galangal is that I, I compare it to potatoes. It grows like potatoes. So mm. the rhizome actually grows up like a potato, you know, with a potato tuber mm. will grow up and then you see the tuber and it turns green. That's not good. You want to cover that potato tuber up. Same thing with ginger. Uh. I grew ginger. The first year I grew ginger in the ground, I like saw the rhizome popping up above the ground. I'm like, oh, I'm doing such a good job. <laughs> Unknowing that I had, I I needed to cover that rhizome up so that that rhizome could continue to develop upward. Um, And that process is called hilling. Mm -hmm. Um, And I did not hill that first year and I got puny ginger. Um, Turmeric and glangal do not need to be hilled. Um, But when it comes to ginger, we will reapply fertilizer like a slow release or a compost every time we hill. So every time you start to see the base of that stem, which is kind of a white to pink color, we add compost or we add soil there to hill it up. Um, you could add wood chips as Ken did also as a mulch. It suppresses weeds, but it all it does the same thing. Straw, same thing. Um, but that every hilling event, we would add fertilizer. Um, for turmeric and galangal, um, I don't really know what would be a, a, a ideal time frame. I would say, you know, you're probably going to want to, if it's again, injected fertilizer, you don't really need to worry about that. If it's, you're, you're irrigating a bunch of crops in a high tunnel. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they're on their own, I would just probably side dress with a slow release fertilizer, side dress with a, a nice high quality compost, you know, two or three times a year. And uh, we don't have recommendations on that yet because we don't mm-hmm. have good data on fertility for these crops in Illinois yet. But uh, we're, we're going to need to keep that fertility up throughout the growing season. Great. And I'll, and I'll say for the stuff we grew, we, I never had to hill. Um, so I was getting a little worried I was doing something wrong because you know, I was expecting to have to hill this stuff. Um, even when we pulled back the wood chips, um, didn't really see much of that stuff exposed. So I think I went in um, just with a, with a quick release in my buckets of water. Um, I think it may have done that Monday in July. So I only really fertilized once. Um, again, we were growing in, in virgin soil, so to speak. So, you know, in, in subsequent years, probably can't get away with that. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. So do you think you planted a little too deep and that's why you didn't see a need to hill or did you have, I heard you had the, the highest yield, but maybe your were your roots smaller than, than Chris's and you just said more of them? Hmm. From what I can remember of digging that stuff, I don't think they were that much smaller. Hmm. Yeah, but beginner's I luck, think, I guess. Well, Ken, I think too, one thing I noticed, at least when we we're harvesting them, and this is might be why they recommend a six inch spacing is because the two plants that are right next to each other, as the rhizomes develop, they develop hands, they call them hands. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of a flat shape. There's one side of the hand and there's another side of the hand. Um, so it's a hand of ginger, hand of, uh, galangal, turmeric, whatever. Um, but the hands that, that seem to develop within that trench that we, we dug, uh, horizontally out not, and, and I think that six inch spacing, you know, the plants next to each other, it allows them to, I don't know, kind of utilize each other, uh, next to each other uh, to kind of help fill in that trench or break up that soil or I, I I'm not quite sure or you know good shading for weeds um but I, I think the spacing helps and I think maybe that the trench that we dug uh helped because they grew kind of laterally outward it was a beautiful mm. trench it was a beautiful trench let's put a picture of that right now Ken dug a great t- trench did you use a, a potato fork or uh or one of those um kind of trench cutting blades on a stick you can buy at Lowe's or what was your tool of choice shovel <laughs> shovel okay got it. I don't know if we had, I don't know if we had a hoe out there too or not but yeah it was just gotcha low in, tech. in Macomb the soil was so compacted we used a mattock uh like a Whoa. pickaxe holy hell <laughs> yeah and that and, and we still grew... got good yield yeah wow huh all right so you heard it here first folks uh these tropical crops might just grow in suboptimal, uh, somewhat compacted soils. So, and and that's always, uh, you know, a concern with vegetables in general, um, which is what a lot of our growers 
that may be listening to this show like to do and vegetables compared to you know grains or uh, perennial crops have somewhat poorly uh, uh, developing root systems and even less so in compacted soils so um, yeah if there's a compacted area of soil on your farm that just hasn't yielded um, good results of vegetables maybe try some ginger this year so um, <clears throat> all right so so talking about um, different uh, success rates of, uh, of growing these crops and yields, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm starting to think um, that this might be worth it, but uh, so how long does it take to grow these crops uh, start to finish? You mentioned we just can't do it uh, without season extension. We're talking about sprouting these things in the next coming weeks. Um, when can you expect uh, to plant and then harvest here in Illinois? So we do have, we, we can compare how we do it in Illinois versus how it's done in the tropics. So in India, um, they plant directly in the ground. They don't need to pre-sprout indoors. They just plant the seed piece directly in the ground in February. Uh, and then from there, it, it sprouts on its own, uh, grows, and they, they cultivate it. And then in about September, uh, the plant will send up a flower stalk. And that flower stalk is actually a trigger for dormancy. And so within once that plant flowers in about September, October, that plant will then begin its, its process into dormancy. And then by the time we get to mid-December in India, that plant will be dormant and they'll pull it out of the ground. So we're talking anywhere from 10 to 11 months of a growing season. We don't have that here in, in Illinois. So that's why that pre-sprouting process is really critical for us to get that jump on the season to get... A, any kind of decent yield when we pull it out of the ground in the fall. And um, that, that's why that season extension is critical. Um, whether it's a high tunnel, caterpillar tunnel, low tunnel, something to push that season as far as you can. Uh, you do not want those rhizomes to be exposed to really anything under 50 degrees. So your soil temperatures, you want to make sure they stay above 50 degrees. Even if the top of the plant gets hit by a cold and it dies back, the rhizomes are still okay in the in the ground, so long as that ground doesn't dip below 50 degrees. And if it goes below freezing, they're going to turn to mush and they'll be they will be dead. Um, and so just those are kind of those critical temperatures. We say watch for 50 degrees when it starts to get below their soil temperature. You need to get them out of the ground. Um, and you know, I, I would say coming out of uh, so we can kind of replicate what they do in the tropics. We can pre-sprout indoors in February and get things planted in the ground. But really our season ends because we run out of daylight starting in September and the days just get so short. And so not much growth happens after I would say the end of September and October, we can hold them there. And when did we harvest Ken um, in Jacksonville? In, uh, end of October, was it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right around Halloween sometime. Yeah. Yeah, we just didn't have enough day length, I think, to put much more growth on as we got mm. later in the season. I think the rhizomes probably can develop a little bit more. Um, and we do see a lot of growth late in the season. Um, so, so yeah, I, I would look towards um, harvesting, at least in Illinois, depending where you're at, north to south, mid-October, late October. We harvested, I think, first week of November for Quincy and Macomb. So uh, I heard you pretty clearly on the harvest day. And then uh, just to confirm, about when do I want to start um, germinating and then planting, just to rehash that? So pre-sprouting, when you get them, <laughs> as soon as you get them. If, <laughs> yes, you can get, if you can do it in February, great. Most of us can't. So it's going to start in March um, when the company starts shipping those seed pieces out. And so that's when that pre-sprout begins, but, but as soon as possible, really. Mm -hmm. um, and then harvest, you just want to make sure that your ground doesn't freeze. If it freezes, you spend all that, you spent that whole growing season on mush. Mm -hmm. And you can't plant too early because your soil's not warm enough. So, yeah. so I'm I'm hearing maybe that that the soil temp is probably the the determining factor. So maybe uh, having a, a good um, thermometer that you could just stick in the soil, maybe a meat thermometer would work. They work um, just as well as a soil thermometer, yep. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, 10 bucks on uh on the internet maybe 15 mm -hmm. will get you a, a meat thermometer that you could use as a soil thermometer and 
use that as your gauge. So great. So we've got the dates figured out. Um, and so, you know, the, in the hypothetical story we're telling here, I'm a, a pretend high tunnel grower. That's a commercial scale type of endeavor. But I want to talk a little bit about the different scales of ginger, turmeric, and galangal growing, um, and then what the best approach might be for the intrepid backyard grower uh, listening today who, who wants to take a crack at it. And then maybe somebody kind of in between um, at Ken's scale last year. So maybe they're going to grow more than a couple of handfuls of, of, of live plants. Uh, maybe they're, they're starting from that rhizome process. Maybe it's a small part-time CSA grower. Um, yeah, so just what is the best option for the backyard grower uh, in terms of structure? And also going back to the planting, what do we, we planted or what? May. So we've got the stuff on the ground. Yes. Uh, and just to add more complication to researching plants, May 2022 is one of the hottest Mays on record. <laughs> that first week of May was in the 90s. Oh, God. Um, it was so hot. It was so hot that first week of May. And so a little bit of an outlier in terms of weather, but might be more business as usual as we go forward. Um, which brings me to the point of the question you just asked, Nick, which is as we move these plants outside, whether you're a commercial grower or you're a backyard grower or gardener, is the idea that even if we harden these plants off, something that kind of one of the big things that we looked at with this research study and why we did caterpillar tunnels versus high tunnels, high tunnels being more permanent structure, caterpillar tunnels being more temporary, and we can take the plastic off, um, is that every year growing ginger in the past, we would get stressed plants in May and June, and sometimes July. I called this heat stress because we're going in high tunnels. We needed high tunnels for the season extension. And it, and it gets so hot in a high tunnel. In the tropics, does it get hot there? It does, but it doesn't get 120 degrees necessarily. Um, in a high tunnel in Illinois, it can get that hot. And so I thought this was heat stress. Reading more data or research out of Hawaii, these plants are actually very susceptible to sunburn. So it's actually light intensity that was stressing these plants, burning them. Now the heat and the drought, like drought, would exacerbate that. And so we grew in the high tunnel, as we always have done. And then we grew in caterpillar tunnels and we, we didn't use plastic in the beginning. We actually used shade cloth all season long. And then we put plastic on in the fall. And to try to see if there was any difference in yield. Um, and I'll just say we didn't have a difference in, in yield. Actually, high tunnels still grew more. We can talk more about that here in a bit. But the critical thing, wherever scale you're growing, is making sure that if you can, do some type of a shade cloth or, or plant out in a partial shade area to protect those plants from that high light intensity. Um, so you could do a high tunnel, which probably most ordinances wouldn't allow, I think in a lot of places where we live, or you'd have to get some type of waiver. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have an HOA, you probably couldn't do that. You probably couldn't do a caterpillar tunnel because caterpillar tunnels are like high tunnels. You can walk right through them. So maybe your option for backyard grower is going to be like a low tunnel or a cold frame or a hot frame, a, a smaller structure. And it can still be done, but those are smaller structures. And so that thermal mass that you build is not going to stay warm on those cool spring and fall nights. And so mm -hmm. you're going to have to keep a closer eye on your temperatures uh, earlier on than if you're growing in a high tunnel versus caterpillar tunnel. Got but it. otherwise, it's, it's, it's easy peasy. I would highly mm -hmm. recommend buy those live plants this first year, try it out, see what you think, um, and go from there. Yeah, I think uh, that definitely there's a lot of information here that may sound, you know, it's like reading the directions, putting together a piece of furniture at home. It always looks, it always looks really intense, and you're like, "Geez, do I really even need to read this?" And usually, <laughs> staring at the parts long enough, you can. If anybody's listening, that's like me, you just kind of like throw that away and figure it out. <laughs> it typically mm -hmm. works out. And Ken's I, laughing, I, so it sounds like maybe he agrees. I have, I have my wife read the directions because <laughs> they just frustrate me. <laughs> Hey, and I do have a video on how to build a low tunnel, so oh, I can link fantastic. to that in the description below. And, and I'd say if you're, if you're doing it at home in pots, you just drag that inside. Mm -hmm. Make it cold and bring it out when it warms up again during the day. So you're that's, great. That's how I grow at home. But, 
Hmm. Awesome. So I'm hearing there's lots of options um, for the uh, excited grower. So um, fear not, it can be done, um, as was the title of uh, Chris's presentation at uh, the <laughs> conference we all just attended a couple of weeks ago. So um, anyway, to uh, yeah, we're going to start wrapping up here. Last couple of questions. Um, once our crops are looking good, uh, we've maintained our soil uh, temperature at 50 degrees. Uh, we've timed that right towards the end of the season, and it's harvest time. Um, so what does the harvest process look like for these three crops? Um, is it like other tuber crops where you need to cut the vegetative portion um, right at the soil line and let them kind of cure in the ground for a while? Or do they come out um, tuber and stem and all and then immediately get separated? Um, yeah, what does that look like? I'm so happy I had Ken to help me. That's all I'll say. It's it's digging. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it is like a tuber. It's like a root crop, like any other thing you got to dig out of the ground. So Ken and I, we went at it with our potato forks and we just, his site was pretty easy. The Quincy site was, was, was easy. My site in Macomb, as I mentioned earlier, it was very compacted soil. It very sore feet and ankles at the end of the day. <laughs> um, and, but yeah, Ken, what, what were your thoughts on the harvest process? You know, so we're only doing 50 foot rows, so it wasn't terribly bad if I had a, a high tunnel or caterpillar tunnel full of it. I probably have a little different opinion, but yeah, basically it's it's kind of like digging potatoes, stick your fork in, pry them out, and just kind of go down the line. Um, so it's there's there's gonna be a little bit of of, of physical manual labor there, but it's not it's not terrible. And, and since we've only got them a couple inches deep, you're not digging down. Uh, terribly deep which i think chris you had some issues with that in prior years yeah there there are some recommendations to plant ginger kind of like you do asparagus so you cut a much deeper trench um and you know how ginger grows up and out or up um so you fill that trench in over the year so you don't have the mass of, you don't want to have like a hill there you just fill in the trench so it's kind of like growing asparagus but unlike asparagus, we don't dig up asparagus, do we, at the end of the year? We dig up ginger. And so that was that was a lot of work to dig down like six to eight inches and try to get that, that darn rhizome out without busting it into millions of pieces as we were doing so. So um, I do like just a trench that's like two to three inches deep, amend with compost and, and go from there and just hill higher with soil or mulch. It, uh, that's the recommendation I would give to most folks. Mm. Um, but yeah, so once you get them out of the ground, you got to clean them off. And I, when we talked to farm partners, they said that's kind of the thing that's the, the biggest pain, the most labor is getting mm. the soil off. And years past, I used a dinky little garden hose nozzle. You know, I set that to the jet setting and I try to blast the soil off there. And it still took me forever. Now, now these are hands. Remember, they're flat. We can we basically line them up in a line, blast them on one side, flip them over, blast the other side. But then Ken, you got to play with the new nozzle this last year. Uh, hands yeah. down, I would do that. Yeah, I think it was nice. And I think the cleaning probably took two or three times as long, if not more, than it did to dig. Um, yeah, that that nozzle was was nice. And even using that nozzle, some of the stuff I took home and used in in between where the fingers were touching you still had dirt and stuff or soil you had to <clears throat> scrape out and stuff so you know i don't know farmers market how you know that maybe if you're selling that something that has been washed up but you may find some in the crevices and i don't know if you'd you know soaking it and agitating the water if that would help loosen it or if that mm -hmm. would cause any issues and stuff yeah still we're still looking at that with some of our farm partners of how to best clean it minimize the labor um or just when you're selling it just tell folks hey make sure you wash it really well because there's going to be some soil left in there i actually know some farmers market clients who uh, believe it or not don't buy anything unless it has soil on it mm -hmm. so you know maybe getting what you can off of it with a higher pressure water setting um in your you know post process and handling setup uh, and then selling it as is with a little soil attached might not be such a liability um so was that type was that like a what about a power washer i could see maybe you know if you took the green tops off first so that you weren't damaging those uh and then 
you know, maybe put them in a bucket and kind of sprayed a power washer into it. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up, but um, that could work. As, as long as you're, so with the power washer, you probably want to go with the most gentle yeah, yeah. nozzle or setting with the power washer because <laughs> you can damage that rhizome. So you just oh. want to be, you do want to be careful, but that like the wash gun that we got uh, mm-hmm. is like a hundred bucks and it is designed for washing fruits and vegetables. So okay. You just just go online and look for a hundred dollar wash gun designed wash for gun. washing fruits and vegetables, and I bet you'll find what we're talking about. <laughs> Great. All right. So yeah, we'll that have would pictures. Be, uh, of, we'll throw pictures of it too. You'll you'll see it. That would be a darn shame to to spend all that time growing something and then damage it when you're washing. Oh my <laughs> yeah. god. Mm-hmm. So uh, all right. So yeah, I I am. I don't know about about YouTube, but I'm getting really excited to try my hand at, at growing this stuff and uh, get to the process of washing and and get to the, the five yard line on the field as it were. Um, but so, so I've got my, my, uh, much coveted, uh, ginger, turmeric and, and galangal, and I've gotten all the soil off of it or, you know, enough. Um, what are the, some, some of the marketplaces, um, that ginger, turmeric and galangal growers are selling into currently or, or could, uh, and then where's, yeah, that best bang for the buck that you mentioned in episode one, uh, when you have a boatload of this, uh, to sell. <laughs> Well, I'll um, share what some of our farm partners did up in Galesburg. And so um, one farm partner, she is, you know, kind of a more traditional fruit and vegetable grower. She goes, she has a market. She used to have a CSA. So in years past, she would actually include uh, ginger uh, in the CSA basket. She doesn't do CSA anymore, just the market. And so, um, but when it comes to CSA, her customers are always so excited. They were so excited to get something different and unique and novel. And so it was, and, and they would ask about it. I think the thing about it is when you have a customer who is willing to stop by your booth or whoever, or email you or whatever, and be, and ask you about something, that's when it's kind of like, all right, they're, they're paying attention. They know now, is that enough to, to flip over an entire bed into a certain crop? Probably not unless you get like dozens and dozens of people asking you about this. Um, and, and so that was nice. So as a CSA, and then she sells at market and she starts harvesting in about August. So she'll pull out a couple things out of the ground. She'll wash them, clean them, and she'll display them um, hmm. at, at the market. And she leaves, um, she'll wash it. And what we pull out of the ground for us in Illinois is not the stuff you have in the grocery store. What we pull out of the ground is called baby ginger or immature ginger. It hasn't developed that skin or that fibrous texture that the stuff in the grocery store has, which grew for 10 months over in India. Um, and so it has a, the, the flavor is fresher. You don't have to peel it. You don't have to, it, and, and it's smooth. It's not fibrous or stringy. Um, and, and it's it's kind of a cream color with pink tops and then a little bit of green, green stem she leaves on and she prunes off the rest of the leaves. So it's a beautiful presentation. It's mm. at least a conversation piece um, for the ginger. Turmeric is the same thing. Galangal is the same thing. Turmeric has is a bright orange yellow color with the green tips of the stems. And in the galangal, we grew red galangal or lesser galangal. And that's like a deep red color again, with green, green tops on it. And so they're presentation wise, they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They could sell themselves at the, the appearance. Um, and, and so that's how she sells. Um, our other grower, um, she is also, uh, she makes teas, she makes spice mixtures, she sells to restaurants, uh, and chefs. And so she would take the greens actually, she, you can dry the greens and you can you can make teas out of them. You can ground the rhizome and make teas out of them or mix them into different tea mixtures. Um, you can take the greens of turmeric and wrap meat in it like fish, poultry. You can oh. steam them and it imparts that flavor because the aromatics are in, not only are in the rhizome, they're in the leaves too. And so, and so she would sell to those different clients. And then I think as we mentioned before, um, uh, maybe last week's podcast, we, we gave away ours to local brewers, uh, and they, they would make some delicious concoctions out of those. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you've already answered the next question, which is, uh, uh, what do I do with the tops? Can I market the tops oh. of these crops? So 
um, yeah, I'm hearing some really awesome uses for those. And um, I think to uh, wrap us up for today, uh, I was going to ask both of you, um, what are your favorite preparations uh, of the fresh roots of these uh, three crops? Or if you have maybe one that stands out um, just to give our growers something to chew on, just listeners rather. Well, Ken, you're the more intrepid cook than I am. So I'll let you take the lead. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so like I mentioned last week, we've used um, the, the turmeric and the glangle and some stir fries and stuff. Uh, ginger, I tried making ginger ale. It does not taste like the stuff you buy in the grocery store. At least <laughs> I haven't figured out <laughs> how to do it. Um, and we made some candied ginger. So basically make a sugar syrup, put your ginger in there and, and take it out. And I think both of you tried that. It's got some some heat to it. Put some hair on your chest. So clean out <laughs> the sinuses, so to speak. So Feel, it felt like I was taking medicine and it felt great. <laughs> it was good for me. That's what it felt like, at least. Yeah, on uh, on that note, um, last week when I was out sick, um, I chopped up um, some fresh ginger and and uh, turmeric and uh, put that in a teapot along with some throat coat tea and some honey. And um, I know this is going to sound gross to some people, but some garlic as well, because it's uh, mm -hmm. you know antimicrobial, viral, etc. Um, supposedly, and it just you know adds to that cold relieving power of all those other um, herbs and red spices rather, and uh, it was awesome. So yeah, definitely more uh, to learn in terms of how to use these awesome crops in the kitchen. And um, thanks for all your information today, guys. Um, I, I know that this was a little bit of a grilling, um, so I appreciate- <laughs> oh, no. this the, was fun. I had yeah, fun. I appreciate the uh, context and I know a lot more about these crops now. And um, I don't know about the listeners, but I can't wait to try my hand at growing some. So thanks mm -hmm. for all the information today. It, it was a lot of information. And so I, I think if, if you, uh, if you're listening, watching, and you have questions, uh, I think this is worthy of a third show. Even we could do a follow-up. If folks have questions, we would love to address those in a, in a follow-up show. And so feel free. We'll put our contact information in, uh, down below in the show notes. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, have to also mention that we want your feedback. Um, so for the research study that we did comparing Caterpillar, tunnel grown ginger, turmeric and galangal versus high tunnel grown spices. Um, part of that study is also getting feedback from you, the consumer or grower, um, or both, well, we, uh, is do you plan to grow this crop or do you plan to eat this crop? Um, and so it, it's a very short survey, I promise. Uh, just head over to go.illinois.edu slash ginger and you can take the very, very quick survey we just want to know, is this worthy of future study? Um, is this a growing crop here in Illinois? There's one more thing I want to add, Nick, that is another reason why we took this on. And that's, we talked about in last week's show about the disease issue, bacterial wilt. Well, the way that, and, and how Hawaii can't really grow this anymore because all soil is infected with this disease. Well, how do they grow this on the other side of the planet? You've probably heard of the technique slash and burn. They have to grow this on brand new soil once they get infected. And so there's a lot of habitat loss associated with this crop. Or they have to leave a field go fallow for several years, and then they can plant back into that. Um, and then we add in transportation costs, with both actual costs and both environmental costs. So if we can provide these spices here locally, they taste better. They are they're more, they have a beautiful appearance, um, and we can support a local farmer. You know that's why Ken, myself, this is why uh, Dr. Shelby Henning at WIU, that's why uh, Katie Bell uh, down at uh, Murfreesboro, that's why you, Nick, uh, we're we're roping you in on this, so uh, you're going to be growing it this year. So that's why we want to learn more about these crops, so we don't have to transport food across the planet in order to enjoy it, we can grow it right here in Illinois. And we can, we can grow everything here in Illinois. It just takes a little bit of learning, a little bit of work. That is awesome information. And I'm uh, looking forward to joining the team. That was a lot of information about growing ginger, turmeric, and galangal. Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension. Uh, the podcast is edited this week by me, Chris Enroth. Um, special thanks to uh, Nick and Ken. So Ken, thank you very much for for working with alongside me this last year, growing these these spices. I hope 
I hope we can continue to do so. And uh, Jacksonville will retain its ginger capital of Illinois. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was fun. I have to go out to the tunnel and start getting things ready so I can uh, defend my title there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. And Nick, thank you so much for being with us these last two weeks, uh, asking questions, learning about these these spices. We um, we are excited to 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 grow these in the at the Unity Community Center Garden. Um, we're going to get them in there. I, I uh, even if I have to sneak in there at night and plant them. <laughs> that sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me on, guys, and uh, hopefully be back soon. Thanks for being here. Hey, uh, mm -hmm. Chris, let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. I don't know what we'll talk about, uh, but we're going to have a topic for you. Um, and it's going to be a, a great and fun, exciting topic. I don't know if we can top ginger turmeric and galangal, though. This, uh, this was too much fun this last two weeks, guys. So uh, listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.